Pilgrim's Progress, the second stage. So I saw in my dream that they walked on their way and enjoyed very comfortable weather. Then Christiana began to sing. Blessed be the day that I began, a pilgrim for to be, and blessed also be the man who that place moved me. Tis true it was long before I began to seek to live forever, but now I run as fast as I can, tis better late than never. Our tears to joy, our fears to faith, are turned as we see. Thus our beginning, as one says, shows what our end will be. Now there was, on the other side of the wall that fenced in the way which Christiana and her companions traveled, a garden that belonged to the one who owned the barking dog. It happened that some branches of fruit trees that grew in that garden hung over the wall with fruit dangling from the branches. Being ripe, the pilgrims found them and gathered them up and ate them to their harm. Christiana's boys, as boys tend to do, were delighted when the trees and the fruit that hung on them, so they plucked the fruit and began to eat. Their mother scolded them, but the boys went on eating their fill of fruit. Well, she said, my sons, you sin. That fruit does not belong to us. But she didn't know that it belonged to the enemy. I'll guarantee you, if she had known, she would have been ready to die for fear. But that passed, and they went on their way. Now once they had traveled about two boat shots from the place where they had entered in the way, they spotted two very ugly men walking swiftly towards them. When they spotted them, Christiana and Mercy, her friend, covered themselves with their veils and kept walking on their journey. The children also continued along the way, and eventually they met up with the two ugly men who had come down to meet them. They walked up to the women as if they would embrace them, but Christiana said, Stand back or go peaceably on your way. But these two acted like men who are deaf, for they ignored Christiana's words and began to lay hands upon them. Christiana became very angry and kicked at them with her feet. Mercy also fought back as well as she could and did what she could do to divide them. Christiana warned them again, Stand back and be gone, for we don't have any money. Being pilgrims, as you see, we live on the charity of our friends. Then one of the two unattractive men said, we don't attack you for money. Rather, we have come to tell you that if you will just grant one small request, which we shall ask of you, we will make women of you forever. Now Christiana could only imagine what they might possibly mean by that. So she said, we will neither hear, consider, nor yield to what you plan to ask. We are in a hurry and cannot stay. Our business is a business of life and death. Once again, she and her companion made another attempt to go past them again, but they stood menacingly in their way. One of the men said, We don't intend to hurt you. It is another thing we want from you. You would have us body and soul, Christiana said, for I know this is the reason you have come after us, but we would rather die right here and right now than to permit ourselves to be brought into such snares and run a risk to our well-being in the future. With that, they both screamed and cried, Murder! Murder! And so they placed themselves under those laws that are provided for the protection of women. But if the field, the men find the girls who is engaged, and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lies with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the girl. There is no sin in the girl worthy of death. For just as a man rises against his neighbor and murders him, so is this case. When he found her in the field, the engaged girl cried out, but there was no one to save her. Deuteronomy 22, verse 25 through 27. Now, like I said, the women and children were not yet far from the gate through which they entered the way, and their screams were heard by those in the house. Therefore, a man hurried out of the house, for he knew that it was Christiana's voice he heard, and so he hurried to aid her. By the time the reliever was in sight of them, 
the women who were caught up in a great scuffle with the two ugly men while the children stood by crying. The reliever who came to save them from the attack called out to the ruffian, saying, What are you doing? Would you make my lord's people sin? He attempted to overtake them, but the two men made their escape over the wall into the garden of the man who owned the great dog, and once there the dog became their protector. With the ugly men gone, this reliever walked up to the women and asked them how they were. We thank your prince, the woman answered. We do pretty well. We have only been somewhat frightened. Thank you so much for coming to help us. If you had it, we would surely have been overcome. So after a few more words, this reliever said, When you were visitors at the gate, I marveled that you knew you were weak women and that you didn't petition the Lord for a conductor so that you might avoid troubles and dangers such as these. He would have granted you one if you had asked. Christiana brushed dust from her dress. Unfortunately, we were so preoccupied with our present blessing that we didn't think about the dangers to come. Besides, who could have imagined that such naughty ones could have lurked so near the king's palace? Indeed, it would have been best if we had asked our Lord for a conductor, but since our Lord knew it would be for our profit, I wonder why he didn't send one along with us. The reliever said, It is not always necessary to grant things not asked for, for by doing such things are often viewed as little value or taken for granted. However, when the need of something is sensed, that thing becomes valued in the eyes of the one who has recognized the need. And when the value which is it properly due is perceived, it will consequently be used after that point, because it is recognized as something of worth. Had my Lord granted you a conductor, you would have not regretted your oversight in not asking for one, as now you have occasion to do so. So all things work for good and tend to make you more wary. Shall we go back again to my Lord and confess our folly and ask for one? Christiana asked. I will present him with your confession of your folly, the reliever said. You do not need to go back again, for in all places where you shall go, you will find no lack at all. In every one of my Lord's lodgings, which has prepared for the reception of his pilgrims, there is enough to furnish them against all such attempts as the one you just experienced. But as I said, he will ask by the pilgrims to do it for them. Thus says the Lord God, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their men like a flock. Ezekiel 35 verse 37. And it is a poor thing that it's not worth asking for. When he had said this, he went back to his place and the pilgrims went on their way. Then Mercy said, Suddenly I feel such a void here among us. I made a whole list of reasons for why I thought we should have been past all danger. In fact, I actually thought we would never see such trouble again. Your innocence, my sister, said Christiana to Mercy, may excuse you of much, but as for me, my fault is much greater. You see, I saw this danger before I even stepped out the door, and yet I didn't plan for it when I could have made provisions for it. I bear much blame. Mercy gave Christiana a question look. How could you possibly know such things before you left home? Please tell me the answer to this riddle. Christiana said, Of course I will tell you, my dear friend. You see, before I ever set foot from the door of my home, I had a dream about this one night as I lay in my bed. In it, I saw two men like these two who assaulted us. They stood at the front of my bed, plotting how they might prevent my salvation. This happened at a time when I was very troubled, and here is what I heard them say. What shall we do with this woman? For she cries out for forgiveness, whether awake or asleep. If she is allowed to go on like this, we shall lose her, as we have lost her husband. You would think this might have made me pay attention to what I needed to bring for this pilgrimage, while I had all the provisions I might need for the asking. Well, Mercy said, due to this oversight, we have been ministered to and had an opportunity to see our own imperfections, for our Lord has used these circumstances to make clear in our sight the riches of his grace. And as we can see, he has followed us with unasked for kindness and delivered us for his good pleasure from the hands of these men 
who were stronger than us. Now, as they talked and walked for a little more time, they drew near to a house which stood in the way. This house had been built to offer relief for pilgrims passing this way. You can find out more about the house of the interpreter in the first part of these records of the pilgrim's progress. They walked towards the house, and when they came to the door, they overheard voices in the house. They listened and thought they heard Christiana mentioned by name, for you must know that talk of her and her children's going on pilgrimage had gone on ahead of her. Those in the house talked about how hearing this news was very pleasing to them, because she was Christian's wife, and she was the same woman who had been unwilling to hear of going on pilgrimage some time ago. Therefore, Christiana and Mercy stood outside the door, listening to the good people inside the house commending her, though they had no idea she was at the door. Finally, Christiana knocked, in the same way she had knocked at the wicket gate. A young damsel came and opened the door and looked from Christiana to Mercy. Then the damsel said to them, With whom would you like to speak? Christiana answered, We understand that this is a privileged place for those who have become pilgrims, and as such we now stand at this door. Therefore we ask that we may come in at this time to partake in your hospitality, for as you can see it is getting late and we are reluctant to go any further tonight. The young woman at the door was named Innocent. She said, Please tell me your name, so I may tell it to my lord within the house. Christiana said, My name is Christiana. I was the wife of that pilgrim who some years ago traveled this way, and these are his four children. Christiana motioned towards Mercy and said, This young woman is also my companion and is going on a pilgrimage too. Then Innocent ran into the house and said to the others, you won't believe who is at the door. It is Christiana, her children, and her companion all waiting for admission here. All those in the house jumped for joy and went and told their master that Christiana and the others were there. So he came to the door and upon it seeing her and the others, he said, Are you that Christiana whom Christian, the good man, left behind when he accepted a pilgrim's life for himself? Christiana nodded. I am that woman who was so hard-hearted as to neglect my husband when he was in distress. I left him to go on his journey alone, and these are his four children. However, I now also have come on the pilgrimage, for I am convinced that this is the only right way. The interpreter said, Then it is fulfilled which is written of the man who said to his son, Go work today in my vineyard, and he said to his father, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Matthew 21, verse 29. Christiana said, So be it. Amen. God made it a true saying regarding me, and granted that I may be found at the last in peace with him without spot and blameless. But why do you stand at the door? the interpreter asked. Come in, daughter of Abraham. We were just talking about you, but now you have come to us for advice as how you are to journey as a pilgrim. He gestured for her to step inside and waved her children and mercy to enter as well. Come, children, come in. Come, maiden, come in. And so they all entered into the house. Once they were inside, they were invited to sit down and rest. When they did, those who ministered to pilgrims in the house came into the room to see them. One smiled, then another smiled, until they all beamed with joy because Christiana had become a pilgrim. They also looked at the boys and gently stroked the children's faces with their hands in a gesture of kind welcome. They also lovingly greeted Mercy and offered all of them a warm welcome into their master's house. After they greeted one another, since supper wasn't ready yet, the interpreter took them into the significant rooms. He showed them what Christian... Christiana's husband had seen when he had visited the house. They saw the man in the cage, the man in his dream, the man who cut his way through his enemies, and the picture of the biggest of them all along the rest of those things that were so profitable to Christian when he had visited. 
after they had seen all these things and christiana and those with her had time to think about all they witnessed the interpreter took them aside again first he brought them into a room where there was a man who could not look any way but down in his hand he held a muckrake one stood above the man's head holding a celestial crown and he offered him that crown for his muckrake but the man didn't look up or regard the one holding the crown in any way instead he only raked bits of straw small sticks and dust from the floor then christiana said i believe i understand the meaning of this somewhat that this is a figure of man of this world it is not good sir you are right the interpreter said he and his muckrake show his cardinal mind you see how he pays more attention to raking up sticks and straws and the dust on the floor than to what he who calls to him from above with the celestial crown in his hand has to say it is to show that heaven is nothing but a fable to some people and that the things here in this world are the only things considered important to them now when you saw that the man with the rake could only look down it was to let you see that when earthly things hold powers over men's mind they completely carry their hearts away from god then christiana said oh deliver me from this muckrake keep deception and lies far from me give me neither poverty nor riches feed me with the food that is my portion proverbs 30 verse 8 that prayer the interpreter said is so little used that it is almost rusty and give me not riches in such a scarce prayer that it is only prayed by one in ten thousand instead straws sticks and dust are sought after as great things by most when that christiana and mercy wept and said alas it is too true after the interpreter had shown them this he brought them into the very best room in the house it was a magnificent room and he invited them to look around to see if they could find anything useful there they looked and looked but there was nothing to be seen except a very large spider web on the wall which they chose to overlook mercy looked back at the interpreter and said sir i see nothing but christiana didn't say a word the interpreter said look again so mercy looked again and said there is nothing here but an ugly spider who hangs by her hands upon the wall the interpreter asked is there only one spider in this entire spacious room then tears brimmed in christiana's eyes for she was a woman quick to understand she said lord there are more here than one is such spiders whose venom is far more destructive than hers the interpreter looked pleased and said you have spoken the truth mercy blushed and the boys covered their faces with their hands for they all began to understand the riddle now the interpreter said the spider you may grasp with the hands yet it is the in the king's palaces proverbs 30 verse 28 therefore this is recorded only to show you how full you are of the venom of sin however by the hand of faith you may lay hold of and live in the best room in the king's house above i thought it was something like this christiana said but i could not figure it all out i thought we were like spiders and that we looked like ugly creatures no matter what fine room we were in but to think that by this spider that the venomous and ugly creature we were to learn how to act in faith and that i did not understand yet the fact that she had taken a hold and lives in the best room in the house shows that god has made nothing in vain their hearts filled with gladness as they looked at each other with tear-filled eyes and then bowed before the interpreter he brought them into yet another room in this room they found a hen and chicks and he told the pilgrims to observe them for a while one of the chicks went to the trough to drink and every time she drank she lifted up her head and her eyes towards heaven the interpreter said see what this little chick does and learn from her your mercies come from above acknowledge this by receiving them with eyes turned to heaven again he told the pilgrims to observe and watch 
and so they paid attention again to the hen and chicks. They noticed that the hen used a fourfold vocal pattern to communicate with her chicks. Number one, she had a common call she used all throughout the day. And number two, she had a special call which she only used once in a while. Number three, she had a brooding note. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Matthew 23, verse 37. Number four, she had an outcry. Now, said the interpreter, compare this hen to your king and these chicks to his obedient ones. For just as the chicks are answered to the hen, the king himself has methods which he uses to call his people. By his common call he gives nothing, and by his special call he always has something to give. He also has a brooding voice he uses for those who are under his wing, and an outcry which sounds the alarm when he sees the enemy coming. I am going to lead you into the next room where such things are, because you are women and they are easy for you. Christiana nodded and said, Please let us see some more. So he led them into the slaughterhouse where a butcher was killing a sheep, and the sheep was quiet and patiently accepting her death. The interpreter said, You must learn from these sheep to suffer and to put up with wrongs without murmurings and complaints. Look how quiet she accepts her death without objection. She permits her skin to be pulled over her ears. Your king calls you his sheep. After this, he led the pilgrims into his garden amid a great variety of flowers. He said, Do you see all these? Christiana said, Yes. He gestured to the colorful display and said, These flowers are diverse in size, quality, color, smell, and strength. Some are better than others, and whether the gardener planted them, there they stand, and they do not quarrel with one another. Again, he brought the pilgrims into his field, which he had sown with wheat and corn. But when they looked at the crops, the tops were cut off, and only the straw remained. He said, This ground was fertilized, plowed, and sowed, but what shall we do with the crop? Christiana thought for a moment and said, Burn some, and make compost of the rest. The interpreter said, What you need to look for is the fruit. You see, lack of fruit will condemn it to the fire, and to be trampled underfoot by men. Be careful that in this matter you don't condemn yourselves. Then, as they were coming back from the field, they saw a little robin with a great spider in his mouth. So the interpreter pointed to the bird and said, Look here. The pilgrims looked, and Mercy wondered what it meant, but Christiana said, What a disgrace to see such a pretty little bird as the robin's red breast in this way. He is a favorite bird to many because they are easily to love, for they are rather sociable towards people. I had thought they lived on crumbs of bread or upon other such harmless matter. I admit I like him less than I did now. The interpreter replied, This robin is a good example, very suitable as an illustration of some who teach publicly, for by their appearance they are, as this robin, notably pretty because of their color and bearing. They also seem to have very great love for teachers who are sincere. Above all else, they show a desire to associate with such teachers, to be in their company, as if they could live upon the good man's crumbs. They also pretend that this is the reason they frequent the house of the godly and the decrees of the Lord. But when they are by themselves as the robin, they catch and gobble up spiders, they change their diet, drink inequity, and swallow down sin like water. So when they arrived back at the house, they went inside, but because supper wasn't ready yet, Christiana decided for the interpreter to show her or tell some other worthwhile and valuable things. This pleased the interpreter. He said, The fatter the sow is, the more she desires the mire. The fatter the ox is, the more playful he goes to the slaughter. And the healthier the lustful man is, the more prone he is to evil. 
there is a desire in women to walk free and to discover something never before seen or known and it is a properly becoming thing to be adorned with that which in God's sight is of great price. It is easier watching a night or two than it is to sit up a whole year together. In the same way, it is easier for one to begin to profess well than it is to continue faithfully on as he should to the end. Every shipmaster, when in a storm, willingly casts items of the smallest value overboard. But who will throw the best out first? No one, except for those who do not fear God. One leaks will sink a ship, and one sin will destroy a sinner. He who forgets his friend is ungrateful to him, but he who forgets his Savior is unmerciful to himself. He who lives in sin and looks for future happiness is like a person who sows weeds and plans to fill his barn with wheat or barley. If a man wants to live well until he reaches his last day of life, he should remember each day may be his last and live accordingly. Backbiting and shifting thoughts prove sin is in the world. But if the world which God sets light by is counted as a thing of worth in the eyes of men, then in comparison, what is heaven which God commends as worthy of notice? If the life that is fraught with so many troubles is so odious as to be let go of by us, what is the life above? Everybody is willing to praise the goodness of men publicly, but who is there who is impressed with the goodness of God as he should be? We seldom sit down to a meal just to eat and leave. In the same way, in Jesus Christ, there is more merit and righteousness than the whole world has need of. When the interpreter has finished speaking, he took the pilgrims out into this garden again and led them to a tree. The inside of the tree had rotten away, and yet it grew and had leaves. Mercy asked, What does this mean? The interpreter said, This tree, which is pleasing to the eye on the outside, but is rotten on the inside, may be compared to many who are in the garden of God. I speak of those who with their mouth speaks highly of God, but in fact do nothing for him. Their outer appearance looks good, but their heart is good for nothing but to be tender for the devil's tinder box. By this time, supper had been prepared and the table spread with a wide variety of dishes, and after one of them gave thanks, they sat down to eat. According to the interpreter's usual hospitality, they enjoyed music played by the minstrels. Among them was one who sang with a very fine voice. His song was this, the Lord alone sustains me, and it is he who does me feed. How can I then want anything of which I stand in need? When the song and music ended, the interpreter asked Christiana what it was the first moved her to take up a pilgrim's life. Christiana answered, First, I thought about the loss of my husband, whom I heartily grieved for, because he had changed but all that was the only natural affection. Then I thought about the troubles and pilgrimage of my husband and how I had treated him like a rude, ill-bred man. So then guilt took hold of my mind. It would have drawn me into the pond except for a timely dream I had about the well-being of my husband and a letter sent to me by the king of that country where my husband dwells to come to him. The dream and the letter worked together and so shaped my thoughts that they compelled me to this way. You didn't meet with any opposition before you left your home, the interpreter asked. Christiana said, Yes, I did. A neighbor of mine, one Mrs. Timorous. She was related to the man who tried to persuade my husband to go back for fear of the lions. In the same way, she also tried to deceive me by calling my intended pilgrimage a desperate adventure and urged me in every way she could to discourage me from it. She reminded me of the hardships and troubles my husband met with in the way, but I got over all that pretty well. The thing that troubled me the most was a dream I had of the two ugly ones, who I thought I plotted about how to make me fail in my journey. 
It still runs through my mind and makes me weary of every person I meet for fear that they should plan to do me harm and to cause me to turn out of the way. I'll tell you this, my Lord, though I wouldn't want everybody to know about it. Mercy and I were so violently assaulted between the wicket gate and arriving here that we cried out murder, and the two who assaulted us looked like the two I saw in my dream. The interpreter said, Your beginning is good, and nearer the end you shall increase greatly. He turned and addressed Mercy, and in the same way asked her, And what moved you to come here, dear one? Mercy blushed and trembled and stood silent for a while, for she didn't know what to say because her experience was so different from Christiana's. The interpreter encouraged her and said, Don't be afraid, only believe and speak your mind. She took a deep breath, let it out slowly and said, Truly, sir, my lack of experience is what makes me want to be silent. This lack also fills me with fear of coming short at the end. I can't tell you about visions and dreams like my friend Christiana can, nor do I know what it is to weep, because I refuse the advice of good relatives. What was it then, dear heart? The interpreter asked. What is it that made you do what you have done? Why? It was when our friends were here was packing up to leave our town. Mercy motioned towards Christina. It just so happens that I and another of our neighbors happened to stop by to see her at the time. We knocked at the door and went into the house. As soon as we did, we saw her preparing to leave and asked what she was doing. She told us she had been sent for to come join her husband. She explained how she had seen him in a dream, living in an unusual place among immortals, wearing a crown, playing a harp, eating and drinking at his prince's table and singing praises to him for bringing him there. While she was telling us these things, my heart burned within me. I thought if this is true, I will leave my father and my mother and the land of my birth, and if I may, I will go along with Christina. Where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Ruth one sixteen. So I asked her more about the truth of these matters and whether or not she would let me go with her, for I recognized there was no longer any way to live in our town without the danger of ruin. But as I walked away from our town, I did so with a heavy heart, not because I was unwilling to leave, but because I grieved for the many relatives I was leaving behind. But I came along with all desire of my heart and will to go, if I may, with Christiana to her husband and his king. The interpreter said, You have started out well, for you have given credit to the truth. You are a Ruth, who, because she loved Naomi and the Lord her God, left her father and mother and the land of her birth to come out and go with people she didn't previously know. The Lord compensated your work, and a full reward be given to you from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come to trust. All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me, and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be filled from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Ruth 2 verse 11 and twelve. When they finished eating and were getting ready for bed, the women were in their own room and the boys by themselves in another room. When Mercy climbed into bed, she could not sleep because she was so excited and full of joy. For now that all her doubts had finally been removed, she laid in the bed blessing and praising God who had showed her such favor. In the morning they arose with the sun and prepared to leave. But the interpreter wanted them to linger a while longer, for you must go forth in an orderly manner. Then he said to the young women, innocent, who had opened the door to them when they first arrived, take them into the garden to the bath, and there wash them and make them clean from the soil which clings to them from traveling. Innocent did as she was told and led the pilgrims into the garden to the bath. 
She told him that they must wash there and become clean, for her master wanted the women to do that and then come back to his house before going on a pilgrimage. The women went in and washed, and the boys did the same, and all came out of the bath sweet-smelling and clean, and much invigorated and strengthened. When they walked back into the house, they looked much better than when they went out to wash. When they returned from the garden bath, the interpreter took them and looked at each one of them. He smiled his approval and said, Fair as the moon. Then he called for the seal with which those who washed in his bath used to be sealed. So the seal was brought, and he set his mark upon them, so they might be known in the places where they were yet to go. Now the seal was the substance and the sum of the Passover, which the children of Israel ate when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand, and as a reminder on your forehead, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth, for with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Exodus 13 verse 9 At that time the mark was set between their eyes and was a seal that greatly added to their beauty like an ornament for their faces. It also added to their earnestness and made their countenance more like that of angels. Then the interpreter spoke again to the young women who waited upon these women and said, Go into the vestry and select garments for these people. She fetched white apparel for each one of them and laid them down before the interpreter. Then he commanded the pilgrims to put the fine, white, clean linen garments on. When the women were dressed this way, they seemed to be a terror to each other, for neither could see the glory each one had in herself, but they could see it in each other. Because of this, they began to honor each other more than themselves. For you are fairer than I am, said the one, while the other said, You are most becoming than I am. The children also stood amazed to see what garments they were brought.